Hello, I'm Grant Stock. Welcome to the Afternoon Show on BBC Radio Scotland. Coming up, double BAFTA-nominated filmmaker John Walsh will be on hand to discuss one of cinema's most admired and influential special effects gurus, legendary movie magician Ray Harryhausen. You're listening to The Afternoon Show with Grant Stott on BBC Radio Scotland. Right, time now to take a journey into a world of thrilling films that could have been. Films from the mind of the stop-motion genius who revolutionised Hollywood special effects, Ray Harryhausen. For those of us of a certain age, Ray Harryhausen is something of a legend and his films are still firm TV staples, which means people of all ages can enjoy his amazing work like Clash of the Titans, Jason and the Argonauts, the Sinbad films, One Million Years BC and a host of, of others. Proof positive that Harryhausen is almost a genre of its own. Uh, we know them simply as Ray Harryhausen and films with their staggering visual effects and amazing monster creations. In 1933, a young boy went to the cinema and found a lifetime occupation. King Kong fired his imagination, his curiosity and his ambition. Half a century later, Ray Harryhausen reflects back on his own creations. Sinbad, Gulliver, the beast from 20,000 fathoms, Jason and the Argonauts, Clash of the Titans, and the host of fabulous creatures from the imagination and skill of the master of animation. Now for the first time, the secrets have been unearthed for those unmade films. Missing scenes from the films you love, Stunning artworks, models and test footage, all revealing new worlds, epic lands and fearsome creatures that, until now, had thought to have been lost for all time. Yeah, just a, a little snippet there from a specially created trailer for a new book from double BAFTA nominated filmmaker John Walsh. He was a teenage filmmaker when he first met Ray and made a documentary about him. The two became friends right up until his death in 2013 and now John has just released Harryhausen, The Lost Movies, which explores his unreleased films. And I'm delighted to say that uh, John joins me now from our London studio to tell us all about it. Welcome to the show, John. Thanks very much, Grant. It's great uh, to be here. Unreleased and unrealised uh, films. These, these, these were films that, that so could have been. So this is what the book is all about. Give us, a, give us an overview. What, what do we have in store? There's some amazing uh, pictures and, and stories in here. Well, there's, there's all of the films that he planned to make. So we kind of created three categories for the lost movies. So the films he planned to make but couldn't either raise finance for get the options for the books or, or perhaps technology um, wasn't advanced enough. Uh, the films he turned down and also scenes cut from his own films because many of the famous films you talked about in your intro like Clash of the Titans mm. and Jason and the Argonauts had scenes that were altered or changed. So when the publisher said to me how many films do you think qualify under these sort of lost categories? I said, oh, I think about 45 or 50. By the time I'd finished the book, Grant, there was 80. Jesus. I mean, it's prolific. I mean, you, you get a sense of this. And just, just listening to you there, that you know, all this work, the work that he did was, was an incredible uh, achievement in itself. But the, here's this, all this work that he didn't actually see through. And what, what strikes me is, thank goodness it's still there. There's, there is this clearly incredible archive of, of, of his work. That's right. The Ray and Diana Harryhausen Foundation was set up in the 1980s by Ray himself uh, to protect the creature collection, all the models, you know, from all the films, uh, but also to, um, as it were, protect and preserve uh, for the future his techniques, which he thought at the time were going to be uh, out of favour and out of fashion. And I don't think he ever imagined that by 2019, stop motion animation would be back and back in the way that it is. But we're lucky that Ray kept hold of everything within... The Foundation's archive, we estimate there's 50,000 items, wow. which makes it the largest of its kind outside of the Walt Disney Company. Well, and I, and I take it you've had complete access to all of it? Yes, I mean, we've had access to everything we knew was that, that was there, and also lots of things we uncovered, especially for this book, because the films that were completed had, um, if you like, filing cabinets full of Jason the Argonauts over here and Clash of the Titans over there. But for the films that weren't made, you know, Ray wasn't that happy that they weren't made. So he didn't necessarily keep them, the papers filed and didn't keep a, an order of the lost films. So it was a bit of a detective job matching paperwork to artwork. So this must have been an, an incredible project for you, given your background, given the fact that you knew him and given the fact that you were such a fan. 
Yes, I mean, I was the ultimate fanboy when I picked up the London telephone directory in the late 1980s and uh, and rang him up. He's, his name was listed. He wasn't ex-directory. <laughs> really? Was yeah, it, he was yeah. the only R. Harryhausen in the London telephone directory. <laughs> so I just cheekily rang him up and uh, doing what you do first, ask your parents if you can use the phone, because of course you had to in those days. And my mum would say, ring after six when it was cheaper. Of course you did. And so I called him up and he answered his own phone. So you can't imagine today, Grant, if I mm. rang somebody up like uh, Peter Jackson or George Lucas, then I'd get straight through to a home number. You'd have to go through a, a whole entourage of, uh, of, you know, representatives and so on. But he was very generous with his, uh, with his time. And luckily for me and, and for everyone else, he kept hold of everything that, uh, from the made and unmade films. So he was a bit of a hoarder in that sense. So, so you met him, you phoned him up, you, you, you met him and you made a, a documentary with him. Of, right. of, of, his, of, of him. What, what was that process like for you? That was, that was quite intimidating because I'd just um, enrolled in the London Film School. I was 18 at the time, um, but it was a post-grad course. So the other students were in their mid-20s. So that was terrifying in itself. And then to do this 16 millimeter, 15 15-minute documentary as part of my, my course there, um, I wanted to do it on Ray's technique and his creatures because I knew he lived in London. Um, so you played an extract there in the opening and Tom Baker is the narrator you hear yeah. over the opening. So I'd managed to get Tom Baker, who was a uh, doctor who, as people know in the seventies, uh, to narrate it for free. So, um, I and think there's, the, yeah. but there's a story that, cause he was in, he was in a film that, that the producers of doctor who spotted. And then that was the whole connection of, of how he became doctor who. That's right. So John Persby was leaving in 1973 and, uh, Barry Letts, the producer of doctor who at the BBC was looking for a replacement and they'd asked lots of people, some well-known people like uh, Ron Moody, who turned it down and, uh, other, other sort of well-known types. And in a, in a sort of a, a sense of desperation, they wanted someone who was different to John Persby. But Barry Letts couldn't really think of, of any names and wasn't really sure. So he was one wet Wednesday afternoon, went to see The Golden Voyage of Sinbad in Leicester Square in London, spotted Tom Baker playing the role of Kura, the villain in The Golden Voyage of Sinbad. When he got back to the BBC that afternoon, he left a call with Tom's agent. The agent left a call where Tom was staying at his guest house. Tom was a labourer on a building site between acting jobs. TV history was made when they met that week and he agreed to play the part of Doctor Who, simply from Golden Voyage of Sinbad. And then years later, you managed to persuade him to, uh, to provide the voiceover for your, for your documentary. I know, cheeky, isn't it? It's, um, it's Sometimes, producers, sometimes <laughs> producers you've just got to be cheeky, isn't it? Sometimes you've just got to be cheeky. Um, but what, what's interesting as well, just looking through the book and, and reading notes, other filmmakers were making monster movies, but Ray never thought of his creatures as monsters, did he? No. So, you know, he'd always pick people up on it and say they were misunderstood creatures. Because I think if we think of um, Godzilla and the way those creatures are motivated, when you strip those films back or watch them without sound, it's really sort of an excuse to trample a, a landscape. And there's no real performance, if you will. Whereas Ray's creatures, they're not all villains. There's some good you know, creatures, there's some bad ones, uh, but there's a performance there. So Medusa is quite feminine when you see her and her approach in um, Clash of the Titans. And other characters, dinosaurs, have their own little characteristics. So Ray felt he could act and create the creatures through acting, but he never thought of them as monsters. He always said they were misunderstood, misunderstood creatures. But, but some of them are very scary. I mean, I mean, we can remember the skeletons from, from Jason and the Argonauts, and, and some are still emotionally scarred by that vision. Absolutely. I mean, you know, when you think of, of those films and Clash of the Titans, they play to a family audience and yet there's some really scary moments. There's some, um, some violent death scenes, there's a beheading. So they, they are very effective and they, they've lasted, haven't they? Because the CG revolution came and it's, and it stayed, but people are returning to raise films. You know, young audiences are, are watching them and seeing them for what they are. Yeah, we're going to talk about his uh, legacy in just a moment. We're going to hear from some of the great filmmakers that he inspired and influenced. Have a listen. I think Ray Harryhausen is really the grandfather of stock frame animation. The father of all we do today in the business of science fiction, fantasy and adventure. Very flattering. Ray is the only technician, really, who is an auteur. It's like God creating Adam. You take clay and you give it life and then it breathes. And Ray did that. Or a Ray Harryhausen monster, you know, they're all beautiful. 
A snippet there from Ray Harryhausen's special effects Titan, a documentary about the great man featuring glowing tributes from the likes of Nick Park, Steven Spielberg, Terry Gilliam, Tim Burton, to name just a few all fans of his work and this this just sort of really underlines his his contribution to film and and the regard in which he's held by by these types of of great names yes it does i mean look when ray died in 2013 george lucas said there would likely have been no star wars without ray harryhausen so i mean that that's quite a big statement to make and if we think of the impact that star wars has had on the marvel universe and so on you know really without ray harryhausen much of what we you know, take for granted today really wouldn't be on cinema screens in the way it is. And this stop motion that, that he's so famous for, but it wasn't just that as well. He also, you know, you, you know, in, in, you know, brought in humans into the into the into the mix as well, didn't he? It was, it really was a, it was groundbreaking in what he was doing. Yeah. So how how do you when you have a small model that's the size of of a, maybe an action man or a mm-hmm. Barbie doll? How do you merge them with a full size actor? So Ray developed different techniques for integrating live action with animation. And it wasn't always the same technique. He would change it per scene or cut to different sequences and different techniques he developed. So it was a case of keeping the audience guessing as to how he did it. But often audiences wouldn't try to find out. They would just be taken along by the story. There was only a handful of, I suppose, there wasn't a name for it at the time, but what we now recognise as geeks or fanboys who were kind of thinking, well, how does he do that? And I was one of those people who got an 8mm camera and tried to do my own little animations, very, very rudimentary. And uh, also in the book, you, you talk about these lost movies uh, and key projects. And what you talked about earlier on as well is films that, that he, he could have been involved in, but, but didn't. And, and the couple that, that sort of spring to mind, uh, I remember when King Kong was remade uh, in the late 70s, he was, he was approached to be involved in that, but, but couldn't because time. Yes, very frustrating. Um, Ray got into the whole science fiction animation Um, area because of the original 1933 King Kong and throughout his career he tried to get it remade they approached RKO for the rights they nearly did it with um, Hammer Films in the 60s so in 1975 Christmas 75 he gets a phone call from the very famous Hollywood producer Dino De Laurentiis directly down the phone and uh, he says is that Ray Harryhausen and Ray says it is he says I hope you're sitting down because I'm remaking the biggest monster movie in cinema history and of course it was the 1976 remake of King Kong mm. they had an enormous budget they had locations already planned they had the cast in place and so Ray was very excited when Dino said to him I'd like you to create the uh, the 60 foot ape so Ray said, this is marvellous. You've got this great budget, this great cast and crew and so on. Um, when, you know, when, when do you need me? And when, when, what's your plans? He said, we need to be in theatres in 12 months. So, of course, 12 months is not enough time. Not really. You would barely have time to, to create the creatures and do the development work. You'd need two to three years. And King Kong is in so many scenes yeah. that more four years would probably be more like it. So, sadly, Ray had to pass. But strangely, rather than go to another more advanced process, they did something that even the 1933 King Kong didn't do. They actually put a man in a gorilla suit. And that's how they created uh, 90% of the effects for the 1976 Kong. Still a very wow. good film, but uh, it's a big step back from what Ray was doing. Absolutely. What, what could have been? What could have been? Um, so just as we're, we're, we're running out of time here, uh, John, what, what would be your, your personal favourite film scene creation uh, of, uh, of this man? I mean, because there must be so much to think of. Is, is there one that sort of stands out as your favourite? Um, we found so many surprising things. War of the Worlds, we found test footage for his 1949 planned version, which would have had Martians on tripoded legs. Um, people asked me which ones I'd most like to remake. Sinbad Goes to Mars, he had Chris Foss, the famous illustrator, come in and work for him on that film in 1979. Chris Foss, at the same time as doing illustrations, which have never been seen before except in this book, was working with Ridley Scott on Alien, with Stanley Kubrick on AI in the early 80s, and Alejandro Jadorowski on his unmade version of Dune. So the artwork for Sinbad Goes to Mars has that real industrial, brutal um, kind of feel and vibe. Um, But I suppose the big news from the foundation is that um, we're in a development deal to make Force of the Trojans, which was the unmade follow-up to Clash of the Titans and should have come out in 1984. And I've been working on that now for the last year and a half. Well, so his legacy and uh, his work continues, which is great news. John, thank you so much for, for taking time to speak to us today. Thanks very much. 
John Walsh there is a new book Harry House and the Lost Movies is out now published by Titan Books if you want more information as always go to the Afternoon Show webpage You're listening to The Afternoon Show with Grant Stott on BBC Radio Scotland Thank you.